All right, I see the participants are coming in. So great. So welcome, everyone. My name is Jennifer Boyko. I'm the manager of scientific operations with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. Uh, thank you for joining us for one of our um, first webinar of the new academic school year entitled An Update of the Prevalence of Osteoporosis, Fracture, Risk Factors, and Medication Use Among Community Dwelling Older Adults in the CLSA. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Center and McMaster University are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Um, Dalhousie University is located in the Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. These lands are bound by the spirit and intent of the Peace and Friendship Treaty. We are all treaty people. As attendees of this webinar, I encourage you to learn more and acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to do research, live and work, wherever that may be. Uh, before we really get started, let's review a couple of our housekeeping points, which we always do at the beginning of our webinars. Everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the session. If you need to uh, change or test your audio during the webinar, you can click audio settings that's on the left of the bottom toolbar. At the end of the presentation, there will be a question and an answer period. If you have a question about the webinar, then or at any time, you can post the question by typing it into the Q&A box located in the bottom toolbar. The questions will be addressed at the very end of the webinar. Um, questions will be visible to all attendees. If you have any technical trouble concerning the webinar, please use the chat box to communicate with our webinar team. So, um, so, the, so post your questions in the Q&A box and any technical issues in the chat box. A feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar, and we invite you to complete this after exiting your Zoom session. Uh, this very brief um, survey provides us with some important feedback that can help us plan future webinars like this one. Now on to today's webinar. Again, the title is An Update of the Prevalence of Osteoporosis, Fracture Risk Factors, and Medication Use Among, among Community Dwelling Older Adults in the CLSA. And it's being presented by Caitlin MacArthur. Uh, Dr. MacArthur is an assistant professor of the, in the School of Physiotherapy at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Dr. MacArthur's research focuses on improving the, effect, the effectiveness of access to rehab for people living with chronic health conditions across the continuum of care, particularly home and long-term care. She is interested in fall and fracture prevention and improving functional mobility with a passion to improve mobility and quality of life of clinically complex older adults. Uh, Dr. MacArthur is a lead instructor of the continuing education course, Bone Fit, which is trademarked, hosted by Osteoporosis Canada, which teaches exercise profession professionals about safe movements, physical activity, and exercise for people with osteoporosis. Um, and now I will pass it on to Caitlin. Welcome. Great. Okay, let me just get my screen shared here so that we're ready to go. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me today. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this project that we did within the CLSA. Um, so we're going to be talking today about osteoporosis. So just so that we're all on the same page about what we mean by osteoporosis, we are talking about a disease characterized by compromised bone strength um, that also has an increased risk for fractures. And this disease also has a significant morbidity, mortality, and economic burden. So just to give you a few examples of that, um, after a hip fracture, about 25% of people will require institutionalization. So for example, moving into a long-term care home and over 30% will die within a year of the fracture. So it can be quite a devastating event for somebody. Uh, and in terms of the economic burden, um, in Canada in 2011, the aggregate cost of osteoporosis attribu attributable factor fractures, sorry, I'll say that again, uh, the aggregate cost of osteoporosis attributable fractures was $4.6 billion. So um, it cost the healthcare system quite a lot of money. 
Um, and resource planning for fracture prevention and treatment relies on accurate prevalence estimates of osteoporosis and fracture risk factors. And so that was kind of the impetus behind the study because we want to know how many people are living with osteoporosis so we can make plans to ensure that they, we can try to prevent those fractures and also take care of the people living with it. So previous studies have estimated the prevalence of osteoporosis in Canada um, and the rates really ranged depending on the study. And it kind of also depended on the type of data that was used to develop these estimates. So the rates listed here are some of the um, most recent uh, rates that have been estimated. So anywhere from 15.8% of women and 6.6% .6 of men, 5.6 to 10.5% of people over the age of 50, 10.1% for adults over the age of 40. Um, and so again, it kind of depended where the data came from for this particular estimate um, as to what the range was. So it could be from administrative data. So looking at um, hospital records um, and um, drug records to see what type of medication people are taking. It could be from clinical data, so looking at how many people have had an osteoporotic fracture um, over time, um, or self-reported data, so asking people um, if they've received a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So you can see why that rate, uh, rate, the rate may range quite a bit, depending on how the data are collected. Um, however, these, though these are the most kind of recent um, estimates, these studies are now, you know, becoming uh, older, so 10 to 20 years old, and we know that the aging population is rapidly growing. So these um, estimates that we developed with this study help us ensure that resource planning kind of keeps pace with the increasing aging population. So we know that we're going to have more older adults. Um, we know that that population, that portion of the population is rapidly growing. So we want to make sure that we can keep up and we know kind of what the prevalence of osteoporosis is in Canada for planning purposes. So what about fracture risk? You notice in my title, I talked about osteoporosis as well as fracture risk. So fracture risk basically is how likely someone is to experience a major osteoporotic fracture in a specified time frame. And depends on the tool that you use, what that time frame will be. Could be a year, could be two years. Quite often it's 10 years. So we kind of estimate what is the probability that someone's going to have a fracture in the next 10 years. As I mentioned, there are a variety of tools used to assess fracture risk. Um, one is called the FRAX, um, and that's the one I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and we're going to be talking about the FRAX that estimate, estimates how likely someone is to fracture in the next 10 years. So fracture risk is really important to gather information about, not just having a diagnosis of osteoporosis, but it's also important to gather that information about fracture risk because many fractures actually happen in the absence of a diagnosis of osteoporosis, either through bone mineral density or other means. So a lot of people will actually have a fracture before they have even been diagnosed with osteoporosis. So and that might be for a variety of reasons that they haven't been diagnosed, um, or they might not meet the threshold for an osteoporosis diagnosis just yet. So maybe they have uh, what we call osteopenia, which is you know slightly more bone mass, but still low bone mass, um, you know, in general. So um, it's really important that we think about how likely someone is to fracture, not just whether they have a diagnosis or not. The other thing is that many people who are identified as high fracture risk are not offered pharmacological treatment or decide not to take it. Um, and so it's really important to kind of capture how many people are at high fracture risk and whether they're taking pharmacological treatment or not. So if somebody is at high fracture risk, the recommendations for osteoporosis and for high fracture risk is that people would be offered a pharmacological treatment for their two kind of manage and mitigate the risk of having another fracture or having a fracture at first. Another recent study also suggested that it's important to understand the proportion of the general population that is at high fracture risk. And this really helps us with proper surveillance and planning. So both understanding how many people have, you know, diagnosed osteoporosis, 
Um, and then how many people are at high risk, because those numbers might be different um, and are actually different, um, but it also helps us with proper surveillance, so understanding what the risk level is in the general population, but also planning. So where do we need to um, have more assessment? Where do we need to intervene? Um, and those types of things. So here are some of the established fra fracture risk factors. Uh, and these are the ones that we looked at within this study. So we know that um, fracture risk, it tends to increase with age. So as we get older, we tend to have a higher risk for fracture. We also know that sex plays an important role. So females tend to be at a much higher risk for fracture than males. Um, having a low body mass increases the risk for fracture. If somebody's had a fracture already, especially an osteoporotic fracture or a, what we call a low trauma fracture. So this would be a fracture that happens um, from falling from standing height or less or the height of uh, two steps or less. Um, or, if, you know, sometimes it can also be an insidious fracture. So it just it happens for no uh, particular event, like there's no fall or anything that kind of caused it. Um, if somebody has a history of their parents having a hip fracture, they're more likely to have a fracture. Um, we know there is a genetic component to uh, fracture risk. Uh, smoking also increases the risk for fracture. Someone's recently taken systemic glucocorticoids um, for you know, a variety of conditions that can also um, increase the risk for fracture as well as having rheumatoid arthritis or living with diabetes, especially particularly type two diabetes. Um, if um, a female has gone through premature menopause, they are more likely to experience fracture. So that's before the age of 45. Um, and that's because there's changes within estrogen that affects uh, the bone. Um, uh, more heavy alcohol use increases the risk for fracture, as well as low femoral neck bone mineral density, which most people are familiar with that. If you have a lower bone mineral density or less bone overall, you're more likely to have a fracture. So these are some of the factors we're going to be talking about uh, in the study. So all of that considered, what were the objectives of our study? So we wanted to, within the CLSA data, provide an up-to-date prevalence of the estimate of osteoporosis. And we looked at both self-reported osteoporosis and DEXA confirmed because both of those were available to us uh, within the data. We wanted to look at the prevalence of fracture risk. So what, what's the proportion of the population that is at high fracture risk? We also wanted to look at the distribution of fracture risk factors and what's the prevalence of those fracture factor fracture risk factors um, across the population. And then we also wanted to look at the proportion of older Canadians who are at high fracture risk who are not taking osteoporosis medications. And why this is important is because, as I mentioned, a lot of fractures will actually happen in the absence of a diagnosis of osteoporosis. And so sometimes looking at high fracture risk is more important. But we also know, as I mentioned as well, that many people who are at high fracture risk are not um, taking osteoporosis medications or are not um, provided osteoporosis medications. So it identifies um, a, a gap in fracture prevention that you know, is something we could target. So in terms of our data, uh, we used data from the CLSA. Um, and these were participants from the baseline comprehensive uh, cohort who completed interviews and the physical assessments. So these were completed between, between 2011 and 2015. And we only included uh, participants who had DEXA data available. So this was uh, 27,685 participants that we were able to analyze their data because of course we wanted to have DEXA confirmed osteoporosis so we needed that data in order to include them in our study. So just a quick review of uh, the data source for CLSA and um, how this, this, the sample from CLSA was gathered. So basically there was three sampling frames. Um, so a subset of participants from Statistics Canada's Canadian Community Health Survey for Healthy Aging, registries of provincial healthcare systems and random digit dialing. Um, and that's how people were recruited into the CLSA. 
Um, and in the comprehensive cohort, the cohort that we used who attended the interviews in person and did the physical assessments and, and data collection, uh, they had to live within 25 to 50 kilometers of a data collection site. Um, and this uh, it excluded people who are living um, in an institution at baseline, people who are full-time members of the Canadian Armed Forces, persons living on federal First Nations reserves and other settlements, um, people living in the three Northern Territories and some other remote regions, those unable to respond in English or French, and those who had cognitive impairment at baseline and were unable to participate. So for our data analysis, we really did a descriptive analysis. So we described the prevalence of five different things. First, we reported the prevalence of self-reported osteoporosis. Next, of DEXA-confirmed osteoporosis. And for this, we used the results from the femoral neck DEXA. And we used the World Health Organization definition um, for our cut points for osteoporosis. So uh, T-score less than um, or, or minus 2.5 or less was considered osteoporosis. Osteopenia was a T-score between minus 1 and minus 2.5. And normal bone mineral density was a T-score more than minus 1. We also described the prevalence of each fracture risk factor within the fracs, um, and the ones that I had kind of gone through previously. And then people who are at high risk according to the FRAX. And the FRAX um, was really great as it was already calculated within the CLSA uh, data. So we were able to pull that information um, from the data that we accessed. So just to give you an idea of what high risk is within the FRAX, this is a 20% or higher chance of a future fracture uh, within the next 10 years. Um, and then we also describe the prevalence of people who have osteoporosis and who are at high fracture risk who are not taking osteoporosis medications. So how we identified osteoporosis medications is we defined those using the drug ID number um, and Public Health Agency of Canada has an operational structure for which drugs are generally used for osteoporosis. Um, and so we use that structure to help identify which are the medications that um, somebody would be taking for osteoporosis. Within this, we did not include over-the-counter supplements like calcium or vitamin D. We only looked at uh, prescribed medications. We reported prevalence estimates both as a percentage um, and as cases per 1,000 persons. We stratified these prevalence estimates by age and sex because we know that those are two very important factors when we talk about osteoporosis and fracture risk. Um, and as is standard um, with these analyses, we used the sampling weights as defined by the CLSA um, and applied those to our analyses. All right, so let's jump into some results. So our sample um, as I mentioned, had about 27,000 uh, participants. Their mean age was 70 with a standard deviation of 10.3 years. And 52.5% of our sample were female. When we looked at the prevalence of osteoporosis, um, so this is self-reported osteoporosis. So the, the participants were asked, has a physician ever told you that you have osteoporosis? Overall, the prevalence was 7.8% of our total sample, um, but 2.2% of males and 12.7% of females, which is what we would expect to see with a, a higher prevalence for females. When we look at DEXA confirmed, we can see that our prevalence is much lower. So overall, 3.6% had DEXA confirmed osteoporosis, 1.2% of males and 5.9% of females. And we'll discuss a little bit why we might be seeing that difference uh, between self-reported and DEX confirmed a little bit later. And then um, it's also really important to think about fracture history. So if somebody's had a fracture in the past, I mentioned that having a fracture, a previous fracture puts you at high risk for a future fracture. So if, when we looked at their self-reported lifetime fracture history, we found that 13.8% of our population overall had uh, reported a fracture in the past, 
uh, and 10.2% of males and 17.1% of females, which is, again is what we would expect to see with a higher prevalence with females. Now I'll, I'll just make an important note here that these were um, all fractures grouped together. So just based on the structure of how the CLSA um, interview guide works, it's hard to disentangle osteoporotic or low trauma fractures from all fractures um, because it doesn't parse out whether they happened, you know, from the height of, you know, just standing and falling over or um, because of no trauma, it's just fractures overall. So uh, that's why we've kind of reported it here as lifetime fracture history, not as major osteoporotic fracture history, um, as you might expect in uh, research related to osteoporosis. All right, so let's have a look at our prevalence. Um, and this is stratified by age and sex across the bottom, with the yellow bars being female, the green bars being male, and then the kind of more solid with some dots being self-reported osteoporosis and the lines being DEXA-confirmed osteoporosis. And we are talking here about cases per 1,000 persons. So we're no longer talking about percentage or proportion. Uh, we're looking at the cases, cases per 1,000 persons. So a few things to kind of pay attention to. First thing is that the prevalence of osteoporosis increased with age, regardless of male or female. We see that there's uh, an increase as we go to the right um, from 45 to 75 plus. The next important thing to notice is that the highest prevalence of osteoporosis is in females aged 75 plus, which again is what we would expect to see. Um, and what was interesting, and I kind of pointed out on the first slide there talking about the population, is that the prevalence of self-reported osteoporosis was always higher. So it didn't matter um, age or sex, uh, the prevalence of self-reported osteoporosis was always higher than DEXA-confirmed osteoporosis. When we get into the discussion, we'll talk about why we hypothesize that might be happening. So the next thing we looked at was the prevalence of the different fracture risk factors. So again, female is going to be the yellow bars here and male is going to be the uh, green bars. And then we have our different fracture risk factors on the left hand side. And going across, we have the proportion of the sample. So again, now we've switched back to proportion of the sample. So in here, you can see that all of the risk factors were higher for females, except for three um, more lifestyle factors. So alcohol intake, smoking, and diabetes, the prevalence was higher for men. Um, and of course, for, for premature menopause here, we've only reported uh, females. Um, but you can see that about 50% of females had um, lived through premature menopause. So um, you can see that the sex difference is there. All right, so let's uh, switch gears and talk now about high fracture risk. So now we're looking at the prevalence of, of uh, people within the population who were at high fracture risk according to the FRACS. So again, now we're looking at cases per 1,000 persons. Uh, yellow is going to be female and uh, green is gonna be male. So some important things to kind of look at. Uh, first in the left-hand corner there we have uh, the bottom left hand corner, we have the uh, purport or the percentage of people at high fracture risk. So overall of the overall sample, it was 2.8 percent, um, 0.3 percent for males and 5.1 percent for females. So um, what we can kind of glean from this figure here is that the prevalence of high risk individuals increases with age. Um, but it's always higher for females. So you can see regardless of male or female, we see an increase as we go to the right, but the yellow bars are always higher than those green ones. And just like osteoporosis, the, the highest prevalence is for females age 75 plus, which again is something we would expect to see. <laughs> 
Okay, so now um, our findings related to fracture risk and medication. So this is now the proportion of the sample or the percentage of the sample who are at high fracture risk but are not taking an osteoporosis medication. So uh, again, the summary on the left-hand side uh, at the bottom for you there, uh, we have 92.7% overall. So that's 92.7% of people who are at high fracture risk are not taking medications. For males, it's 97.8%, and for females, it's 82.6%. So you can see it's quite high overall. So some things to uh, notice from this figure as well is that the prevalence uh, is now kind of the opposite. So it's always highest for males. So those the green bars, um, within the same age category, the, the prevalence of men who are at high fracture risk or males who are at high fracture risk and not taking medication was always higher than uh, females within the same age group. Uh, for males age 45 to 54, there were not any males in that age group that were at high risk and that's why that proportion there is zero. And what was also interesting is that prevalence uh, decreased with age. So the prevalence of people who are at high fracture risk who are not taking medications decreased with age, but it always remained above 70%. So that's quite a high number. So for all groups at, um, at best, or at, at worst, I guess, 70% uh, were at high fracture risk and not taking medications. So it's quite a high proportion of people. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of these results and why we might be seeing what we're seeing. So the first thing is that we had a lower prevalence of osteoporosis than previously reported. So overall, our DEXA confirmed osteoporosis was 3.6%. And this is uh, lower than uh, the lowest prevalence that's been reported before of 6.6 .6, um, or you know, as high as 15.8%. So why we might be seeing this, um, these differences is um, first we report DEXA confirmed, um, whereas the other studies that I mentioned before reported self-report or um, a confirmation of osteoporosis from administrative data. Um, and importantly, in our study, we found that self-report overestimated prevalence of osteoporosis. So if we recall back to the first figure I showed you, self-reported osteoporosis was always higher than DEXA-confirmed osteoporosis. So it could be that previous studies that relied on self-report were overestimating the prevalence um, because there's this discrepancy between self-report and uh, DEXA-confirmed. Another possibility is we have seen in, uh, in previous studies um, that have been done fairly recently that Bone mineral density is actually increasing and hip fracture rates are decreasing. And, you know, there's a couple thoughts as to why this is happening, um, why we might be seeing this kind of shift over time. There is a higher prevalence of obesity. Um, and if people are living with obesity, they're generally at a lower risk for fracture. Now, there are people who living with obesity who are at higher risk for fracture for various reasons. Perhaps they're living with diabetes as well. But generally we see um, if you have a lower body mass index, you're at a higher risk for fracture. But a higher body mass index, you might actually be at a lower risk for fracture. There's also lower smoking rates. And we know that smoking can increase the risk for fracture. Um, as well, though, you know, my data kind of suggests that there's not many people receiving osteoporosis treatment. Over time, we have seen some increases in osteoporosis treatment in general. So more people might be getting uh, and receiving treatment. So that might be why we're seeing the results we see. The last possibility is that the CLSA cohort could be a healthier co cohort than uh, we see in the general population um, or that we see in those previous studies that have been done. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in the limitations section, but if they, uh, generally the CLSA cohort is a little bit healthier, uh, then we might see lower rates of osteoporosis than in, in populations that aren't quite as healthy. 
The next thing that uh, I'd like to just discuss is a significant primary fracture prevention gap. So we found that many, in fact, most uh, people who are at high fracture risk are not on a, uh, or not receiving an osteoporosis medication. And there's been previous work that has found uh, similar results. So a study was done uh, across 27 European countries, and they found that only 55% of postmenopausal women who are at moderate, high, and very high fracture risk were untreated with medication. Um, and so this study has you know, slightly different results because they included moderate, high, and very high, whereas we just included high. Um, based on FRAF, so that's why you might see some differences there, but we do see that there is still this significant gap in people being high risk and people receiving medication. Now, we weren't able in our data to understand why people might not be taking medication, and there's a lot of different reasons. So um, some of the osteoporosis medications have significant side effects, um, and so people choose not to take that medication because it can be unpleasant um, and they don't want to have those side effects or they're fearful of some of the rare but serious side effects that can happen with these medications. Um, financially, there might be some constraints whether medications are covered by drug plans or not. Um, lack of efficacy, and I put in brackets perceived lack of efficacy, so um, there's also there's kind of the real lack of efficacy that might be in play, but also people um, not perceiving that there might not be efficacy related to medication use, um, as well as inconvenience. So some of the medications, uh, the preparations are changing over time, but some require some you know specific ways that you take the medication, um, and so they might choose not to take it because it feels inconvenient um, at the time. Or they just may choose not to take medication for a combination of all of these reasons together. But what's important is that previous work suggests most prevention focuses on secondary prevention. And what that means is that we focus a lot on preventing fractures um, after they've happened, which sounds kind of funny. But basically, if somebody's had a fracture, that's when we put um, something into play to try to prevent the next fracture from happening. So there's a lot of screening programs within hospitals where um, somebody has a fracture and then, then they will be followed up and they might have a bone marrow density at that time. Um, and then they might be on medication after that, or there might be more um, or other kind of prevention uh, strategies put into place after that. Um, but we don't tend to focus a lot on primary prevention. So trying to prevent the fracture before it even happens. And that's really important because as I've said a couple of times now, if somebody's had a fracture before, they're a lot more likely to have a second fracture. And so if we can try to prevent that first fracture from happening, it can be really, really important. Um, and fractures result in substantial pain for the person. Um, they can be quite you know, debilitating. Um, have a lot of disability associated with them. They cost the healthcare system billions of dollars, as I mentioned. Um, so fracture prevention really should be optimized. We shouldn't wait till someone has a fracture to try to prevent the next one. I mean, of course, we want to still do that, but we will also want to try to prevent that first fracture from happening. So I think this, the results of this study really point to uh, an opportunity to engage in primary fracture prevention, where we try to prevent that first fracture from happening. So I've, I've kind of mentioned a couple times that the prevalence of self-reported osteoporosis was higher. Um, and this has uh, also been found in previous work. So it does, our, our work does agree with previous work. So here's a few examples. Um, so only 62% of people in, in this one study here um, with DEXA-confirmed osteoporosis reported their results correctly. So they said, yes, I have osteoporosis. Some people might have said, oh, they have osteopenia or lower bone mass, um, or they might have said, oh, no, my bone health is fine. Um, another study found that oftentimes people will report osteoporosis when they are osteopenic, and so that's where things get kind of confused. And that's really just related to the cutoff scores that are applied to bone mineral density. Um, we know that if people are osteopenic, of course, it's, it's important to still um, think about fracture risk, 
but oftentimes people get confused between the two. And that's so that might be why we're seeing a higher prevalence of self-reported osteoporosis, because maybe people were osteopenic and saying they had osteoporosis. We could actually look at this with the data, um, but we, we didn't delve into it for this particular study. Another study also found that people often confuse osteoporosis with other conditions that affect our bones, like osteoarthritis. Um, and this is quite common. Somebody might think, oh, osteo something, um, but they're not sure what the something is. And so they, they confuse the two um, conditions with each other. Um, also, it's been found that there's often a poor communication of a diagnosis from a healthcare provider. So it might be that the person didn't understand, but it might also be that the healthcare provider hasn't really provided a good communication of, of what uh, the person is living with. So looking at the bone mineral density reports, um, taking everything into consideration, uh, it, it might not be clear to the person what uh, it is that they're living with. And within this study, uh, they also found that there were some factors associated with accurate reporting of osteoporosis. So they found that uh, females were more likely to accurately report their, uh, their osteoporosis. Um, they found that um, accuracy varied by race as well as by bone um, body mass index. Uh, if people were living with poor health or had a history of fractures, um, and if they were receiving osteoporosis treatment. So um, that's another kind of interesting thing to take into consideration that uh, it might not be just confusion, it might not be poor communication, but there's actually some inherent uh, reasons why people might have um, uh, an understanding of what their health is. So the important thing to kind of take from this is that education about the disease may be needed for people who inaccurately report or people who tend to inaccurately report. So in general, we might need to think about how we uh, improve communication about an osteoporosis diagnosis and how it's different from other um, disease conditions like osteoarthritis. And the last kind of important finding is that osteoporosis is undertreated in males more than females. So we saw that uh, our results were kind of flipped for when we looked at the prevalence of people at high fracture risk who were not receiving treatment and it was always higher in men or in males. So this is consistent with other literature as well that osteoporosis is traditionally underrecognized in males, it's often thought of as a uh, older woman's disease. And so we don't often think about males living with this disease. Um, and males are often not targeted for primary prevention. Um, they often receive secondary prevention of treatment uh, related to secondary osteoporosis. So osteoporosis can de develop from um, many different conditions. Um, for example, rheumatoid arthritis was one example uh, within the fracs, but there's some other reasons why people might uh, develop osteoporosis secondary to other treatments or um, other uh, conditions that they're living with. And so uh, a previous study found that uh, the factors associated with osteoporosis care really focused on secondary prevention. So people who uh, or males who received osteoporosis care were more likely to have multiple comorbidities. They were more likely to have received uh, hormonal therapy for prostate cancer, which is a risk factor for osteoporosis. They were more likely to have vertebral or hip fractures um, and receive glucocorticoid treatment. So I think oftentimes we might think about osteoporosis in the context of a uh, secondary condition for males. Um, and then we under-recognize that kind of primary prevention. So it's really important to think about primary prevention for males um, and promotion of that and not kind of uh, thinking that osteoporosis only affects females, especially older females. So the strengths of this study are that the CLSA is a population-based national cohort with stratified random sampling. And we also apply the sampling weights to minimize sampling bias. So uh, that means that our, our results should be um, you know, generalizable to the Canadian population over the age of 45. Some limitations um, to our study, as I mentioned, we didn't examine the reasons behind not taking medications, but that could certainly be a future study. So we only looked at whether they were taking them yes or no, not why 
they might not be taking them, but I think this kind of opens the door for future research into that area. Um, we didn't include lumbar spine T-scores because they weren't available to us at the time of uh, our analysis. So sometimes when we look at the prevalence of osteoporosis, we look both at femoral neck and lumbar spine T-scores, um, but we didn't have access to those lumbar spine T-scores when we um, did our analysis. However, the femoral neck is really the most extensively validated site for the definition of osteoporosis. And it also provides a higher gradient of fracture risk than many of the other techniques. So we felt confident in our results. Um, as I mentioned, the CLSA cohort may have been healthier than the kind of general population. Um, uh, indeed, at baseline, you know, people with cognitive impairment were, uh, who couldn't participate were excluded. Um, and people living in institutions. And we know that these two particular populations are at higher fracture risk. So really we, our results are kind of generalizable to the healthy older population living in the community in Canada. We also couldn't establish a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis or high fracture risk based on previous fracture. Um, and this is because um, we weren't able to ascertain whether our, the fractures were low trauma or not. So as I mentioned, when I talked about um, lifetime fracture history, uh, we couldn't parse out which of those fractures were low trauma. And oftentimes, knowing if somebody has had a low trauma fracture will help us make a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis or help establish if somebody is high fracture risk. So we just weren't able to look at that. Um, we had to rely on the FRAX, um, DEXA, and self-reported osteoporosis. And finally, our study was cross-sectional um, and really we're describing a prevalence kind of at that cross-section. So we couldn't determine how many people may have experienced a fracture after uh, our assessment. So, um, you know, we know what their fracture is fracture risk is at this one time point, but we don't know whether they fractured in the future. Again, I think this opens up a door for a previous or for a future study um, to kind of look at this, uh, this information. So in conclusion, uh, we provide an updated prevalence estimate of osteoporosis for community dwelling older adults age 45 to 85. Uh, we found that most community dwelling older adults at high fracture risk are not taking osteoporosis medications, especially males. And this in particular presents an opportunity for primary fracture prevention in the community. So I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge uh, people who have been involved in this project. So this project was started uh, at the Jarrah Center for Aging Research um, and funded by a Catalyst Grant from the CIHR. Um, I'd really like to thank Arum and Hajar for um, helping with the data analysis and for being co-authors. And then the other co-authors listed there for their kind of critical feedback and help in designing and carrying out the study. Uh, this study has been published in the Archives of Osteoporosis. It's there for you on the right, and I believe uh, the link was going to be shared with you. And uh, if you're interested in other work by our group, uh, looking at osteoporosis, fractures, uh, falls, etc. within the CLSA. Uh, we just published this, this uh, study in JBMR. It's just been accepted uh, just on September 5th, so just a few days ago. Um, but you can look at the associations among cognition, frailty, and falls, and self-reported incident fractures. There are some interesting finding there, findings there as well. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me today. I'm really excited to answer any questions that you have. Um, you can always email me at my email address there or uh, catch me on Twitter as well. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, and congratulations on all your uh, recent work. Um, you, the great exemplar of, of how to uh, use the CLSA data for um, very important issues. Um, I, I know there was there's a couple questions that came through and, um, you know, two of them were sort of, I guess, I guess it speaks to the personal nature of, of this issue. And um, um, Caitlin, maybe I'll let you read the, the couple comments um, that were posted, but, you know, I think it speaks to the um, importance of, of there needing to be good clinical practice guidelines coming out of, of work such as, as what you're doing. Um, the example that was posted about, um, you know, a physician's 
uh, not providing or, or sort of uh, downplaying the, the, the medications that were being suggested, but perhaps upplaying um, a bone density test. Um, and then, you know, what the other example in the chat is sort of is an example of, well, you know, I don't fit within any of what I'm being told, what should I do? So I'm just wondering, just I said we can't really sort of touch on personal uh, responses, but maybe anything, is there anything from your research that you think could be a contribution to um, good practice, clinical practice guidelines, or is it going in that direction at all? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'll just put a, a plug for uh, Osteoporosis Canada's new guidelines will be coming out shortly um, within the next several months. Uh, so those will be updated and they have sections on fracture risk, um, you know, that I, I kind of talked about and uh, medications when they should be you know, considered and when they should not be considered and how to kind of have that conversation, as well as other lifestyle factors like uh, exercise and nutrition, which are certainly important. Um, we didn't focus on them on this study in particular, uh, but we did, uh, you, we know that they are important things to consider as well. Um, so those, those will be coming out very, very soon. Um, so I would definitely uh, urge people to kind of look to those as they come out. Uh, you can check Osteoporosis Canada's website um, for updates on those. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of the work that we did here supports um, some of that work, just thinking about, you know, when medication might be important, important when uh, uh, other factors might influence decisions about um about choosing to use a medication or not. Um, and that's certainly a conversation that you want to have with, with your physician. So yeah, I think, you know, keep your eyes out for the, the new guidelines that are coming and they have sections on all of the things that I talked about today. And of course, I think it's a, a, a reminder always that just because we have these guidelines doesn't mean they're necessarily used in practice. And um, the whole idea of, you know, <laughs> Uh, implementation science and, and ensuring that these guidelines are used once they're developed uh, is important as well. So, but that's a whole other uh, uh, topic discussion on knowledge translation. Um, so the, another question was, why is paternal osteoporosis disregarded as a risk factor in fracks? Um, uh, why is paternal, oops, I went back a section there. So it's actually, um, just going back here, it's parental uh, hip fracture that is considered. Um, usually maternal is more uh, relevant because we often have osteoporosis, women often have osteoporosis, um, and so they might be more likely to fracture their hip. Um, however, um, I think paternal would be relevant. Uh, and I think that'd be something that would be interesting to look at in the future is if including paternal would be helpful. Um, it might be that the prevalence of paternal hip fracture is so low. So maybe there aren't a lot of paternal hip fractures um, that it might not play as much of a role, but I think it's worth, it would be worth looking into in the future. Um, and what about, um, uh, can you assess the role of bone intense exercise in preventing fractures? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we didn't do that in our study. Um, it could potentially be looked at within the CLSA. I think the difficulty would be parsing out um, what and making sure we're really clear on what the definition of bone intense exercise would be. So being able to figure out if people are doing resistance training or weight-bearing training, um, that would be the most important. Um, so that, that could be a future study as well. I think it'd be interesting, and we just have to think really carefully about how we define um, that bone-intense exercise and what variables we could use within the CLSA. Um, and as more kind of waves of data come in, because um, right now we are just looking at baseline, but as we look you know, to the future, to follow up one, follow up two, follow up three, and we have those bone mineral density results, we can look at changes relative to exercise or nutrition. Um, so it, it definitely could be a possibility. We didn't do it in our study, but uh, especially because we were just looking at baseline, 
um, at cross section. So we wouldn't have been able to really know um, the relationship very well. And we have a couple questions from Theodora. So I'll just read them both at once. Um, did the death rate in adults over age 75 affect your statistics? And uh, can you just briefly review the difference the difference between osteoporosis and osteoarthritis? Sure. So uh, we didn't look at the death rate, um, but we did have a good um, a good population within the age uh, group of 75. And we were at cross section. Uh, so we were just looking at baseline. Um, so even if people were lost to follow up one, it wouldn't have affected our results because we were just looking kind of at one time point um, and not following people up over time. So in our uh, study, if I go to the end here, oopsies, went way too far. Um, if I go to the end here, um, this study, we actually did look at people and how they changed over time. So that's where death rate would come into play. But for the, the study that I presented today, it wouldn't have really affected our results. Um, and then if we think about the difference between osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, so osteoporosis uh, affects um, the amount of bone that we have, as well as kind of how that bone is structured. Um, whereas osteoarthritis, it really affects the, uh, the bone where it meets another bone, so within a joint, um, and it affects the cartilage within that joint. Um, and you get things like spur bones like um, osteophytes I should say uh, which are like bony growths kind of within that joint space um, you get less joint space so it affects kind of more the joints and the mobility of those joints and how the two bones interact with each other um, whereas osteoporosis affects kind of the amount of bone that we have um, and you'd be at higher risk for breaking a bone because of the amount of bone that you have whereas with osteoarthritis might affect things more like mobility, um, you know, pain, uh, range of motion, those types of things. Osteoporosis can affect mobility and pain and range of motion, but it's usually related to having a fracture, either of the hip or the spine or the wrist, or other places too, but those are the most common. Okay, we have a few more questions here, so we'll see how many we can get through in the next couple minutes. Um, the next one's about the FRAC score, and if you know when it was first implemented, or uh, might it be updated? No. That is a good question. I can't tell you the exact date <laughs> or the exact I'm year, about that. Uh, <laughs> but it has been a while. Um, but it is continually updated, and there are there have been a lot of studies where they're looking at adding, for example, falls. Uh, to the fracs and then, you know, how good is it without bone mineral density and with bone mineral density, with falls, without falls. So I know there there's continually research related to the fracs um, and the factors that go into it. Um, it's also um, country specific. So there is a fracs calculator tool um, that you can go to if you just kind of Google fracs, one will pop up and you, you can choose which country. So um, I think they're always kind of updating it and putting work into figuring out, like, are these the best variables that we have? Should we consider other things like falls? Should we look at cognitive impairment? Those types of things. So there is lots of work kind of con continually going on around it. Uh, and uh, this one relates to diabetes. And why is diabetes type 2 more of a risk than type 1? Uh, it's just related to the disease process, and I, I can't get into the physiology because I, I don't know it very well, but it's related to the physiology of the disease um, and how that interacts with the physiology of bones. Um, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this one either, but if patients had a 20% risk factor in most other diseases, that would be a matter of concern. Why does the risk have to be 20% over 10 years for this primarily women's disease to be concerning? Yeah, so that's the cutoff that when they developed FRACs that they decided would be the cutoff for high fracture risk. Um, and I, I can't speak to the reasons why they decided 20%. They, I think it was related to, um, you know, disability and economic trade-off um, and how all of those things work together. Um, 
but FRAX is one of the tools that can be used. There are others. Uh, fra the reason why FRAX is we used it here is because it, it is calculated within the CLSA, so we were able to use it. But there are certainly other tools out there that can be used. Um, so there's like the Kerok, um, and there's like the Q tool. There's, there's, so there's lots of other um, fracture risk calculators that can be used. And as I mentioned, they can vary depending on the year um, that you use. So, um, or the amount of time. So it can be like a one year fracture risk, two years, five years, 10 years. Um, that's just the one that FRAX decided to go with. Um, if you're interested in this, this is a section that is really being updated in the uh, Osteoporosis Canada guidelines. So uh, it'll, stay tuned for that. Uh, there'll be a really good discussion of, of different fracture risk tools and decisions around which one to use and when to determine someone's high risk and not. Um, we have a last question. I, I, it might be a little bit more, I can't necessarily uh, interpret if it's a more personal in nature or not, but um, generally speaking, um, if somebody had a bone density test 30 years ago and now perhaps needs a new one, is there any guidelines on how often you should um, get a new bone density test? Yeah, so certainly 30 years is quite a long time. So I would, uh, yeah, 30 years would be a, a reasonable amount of time. It really depends on uh, a variety of things. Um, it depends on, you know, your risk factors. So if somebody is at high risk, but they're younger, um, then it would be warranted. But if you're uh, younger, but not at high risk, then it, you might not be warranted at that time. So it it's there's kind of an algorithm and a lot of different factors that go into play. Um, and then it depends, uh, you know, are you on a medication? Have you had a fracture recently? Um, and all of those things kind of go into deciding when the follow-up should be. Um, or, you know, have you had, maybe you had a, a, a bone neural density test and then, you know, maybe two or five years later, you had another one and there was no changes, then we might not want to follow up as frequently, but if there, you know, there's really big changes, then you might want to follow up more frequently. So it kind of, it's more of an individual uh, decision as to when, when those should happen. But I would say 30 years is, is a long time and things have probably changed over that time. Okay. Well, I think we will start to wrap up. Um, again, thank you very much for the presentation and lots of good questions that came through. Uh, we really appreciate your participation in the seminar series as a, the, the webinar presenter, but also for all of you uh, for participating. For more information, the link to the publication of this webinar, webinar is based on is available in the chat. It's already been posted, um, as well as a link to the related approved article, uh, which I believe, I think that was the one that was just published, actually, uh, that you mentioned. Um, I'd like to remind everyone also that the next deadline for data access application, if you're interested, is January 18th of 2023. Uh, please visit the CLSA website under data access to review uh, what data is available, as well as additional details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey when you exit today's Zoom session so that we can learn how to improve these, these webinars as well as the topics. Uh, for the next CLSA webinar, it will be entitled Enhancing the CLSA Research Platform, Updates on New Initiatives, Data Availability, and Access. And it will be held on October 31st uh, at, at noon, uh, so Halloween. Uh, that webinar will be presented by Dr. Perminder Reyna, who's the lead principal investigator of the CLSA, as well as Dr. Matilda Saliba, who's the data access officer of the CLSA. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join join us for that presentation, and hopefully we can get uh, our, our presenters to dress up that day as well. Uh, registration details for that webinar will be posted on our website, um, so that link is also available on the screen. Um, and remember, the CLSA does promote the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we invite you to follow us on Twitter uh, at at CLSA underscore ELCV. And that is a wrap for today. So thank you again, everyone. Bye-bye.